chairs and state traffic state traffic engineer with the Office of Traffic Engineering at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. I would like to start out by thanking our hosts. the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and the Minnesota Departments of Health, Public Safety, and Transportation. Before we start, we wanna make sure you know this webinar is being recorded um, and all attendees are muted. So you'll be able to find several useful items on the Minnesota TZD website after today's webinar, including PDF copies of the speaker's PowerPoints, a PDH form, and a recording of today's event if the hot dish ends up being so good you want second helpings. Or maybe there's someone you know who couldn't join us this morning that might be interested in today's hot dish. Video and audio for all participants is turned off, but you can communicate with the speakers or other participants using the chat and Q&A boxes at the bottom of your screen. You can use the chat feature to introduce yourself, share ideas with all participants, or to let us know if you're having AV or IT issues. There may be a couple times throughout the presentation where we prompt some discussion and ask a few questions through the chat box. So um, please don't hesitate to share your ideas. We encourage interaction and discussion through this chat function. Note that you can set a chat either to all panelists or to all panelists and attendees. So choose wisely. Use the Q&A button if you have a question for our speaker. I'll keep an eye on that. If, there, if a question is relevant and easy to answer in the moment, I may share it with the speaker during the presentation. Otherwise, we should have time for questions after all three of our speakers are done with their presentations this morning. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as IIJA, and also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or BIL, was signed into law by President Biden on November 15th. The IIJA includes provisions to help make our roads safer, our vehicles safer, and to support efforts to encourage safer behavior among those who drive our roadways. We have three speakers today that will provide insight on these provisions and to help us understand the opportunities we will have in the coming years to take traffic safety to the next level in Minnesota. Russ Barton joins, joins us from the Governor's Highway Association, the Governor's Highway Safety Association, GHSA, to highlight traffic safety funding and policy aspects of the new law from a national perspective. Stephanie Manning from Mothers Against Drunk Driving, or MAD, will help us understand the drunk driving prevention provision in the new law, including where vehicle manufacturers are at with the technology needed to abide by this new law. And finally, our own Mike Hansen from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety will provide some specifics on what the new law pr provides for us, specifically in Minnesota. So if everyone's buckled up, let's get this ride underway. Our first speaker is Russ Martin, who is the Senior Director of Policy and Government Relations for GHSA. He represents the state highway safety offices before federal agencies and Congress and works closely with partner organizations to improve road safety and promote GHSA objectives. Martin is a national expert on behavioral traffic safety issues and directs GHSA's engagement on emerging, emerging vehicle technology. He manages the planning of the policy content of GHSA's annual meetings and plans and serves as a faculty member of GHSA's Executive Seminar for Program Management. Prior to joining GHSA, Martin was Manager of State Relations at AAA. Thank you for joining us this morning, Russ. The floor is yours. All right, well, thanks so much. Let me fire up my slides. And um, all right, so uh, again, I'm Russ Martin, Senior Director of Policy and Government Relations with the Governor's Highway Safety Association. If you're not familiar, uh, we're the Association of State and Territorial Highway Safety Offices, and that includes the Office of Traffic Safety in Minnesota in the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. But you can see from the map that uh, about half of our members uh, are located in state DOTs and the others like in Minnesota are located elsewhere in state government. All of our members receive grants from the National, Tra uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to do behavioral highway safety programs on the state and local level. And they apply for that funding by submitting an annual highway safety plan every year to NHTSA. NHTSA approves it and provides the grants to uh, the State Highway Safety Office, which then provides 
it uh, provides funding to subgrantees to carry out safety safety projects and programs. And GHSA's role uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is to serve, uh, at times to serve as a sort of a liaison between our members and NHTSA to, make, to ensure that our members are complying with NHTSA regulations and also making sure that uh, NHTSA regulations themselves are clear and consistent. Uh, but within the last couple of years, we've actually been uh, active on Capitol Hill in the midst of the transportation reauthorization, which is embodied in the infrastructure bill that was in, uh, passed by Congress uh, last year and signed into law by President Biden. And we work with, uh, with our members, with our partners to pursue a number of different priorities in the highway safety area. And I'm pleased to report that we were able to achieve a number of them uh, it, within the bill as we'll discuss uh, throughout, so hopefully we'll discuss uh, throughout today's webinar and uh, as we, we shall demonstrate. So first of all, I wanna flag that this is a, a huge bill. It's uh, al almost half a trillion dollars of transportation, energy, and other kinds of infrastructure investment. And so transportation itself is only a small part of it and safety is only a small part of it, but uh, we see tremendous uh, increases in safety programs across the board. You can see on screen um, in the upper column are uh, code code sections that that correspond to different uh, highway safety grant programs, and you can see there are significant increases year to year uh, throughout the period of the authorization, which expires at the end of federal this year, 2024. In addition, there are investments in FMCSA uh, programs. Uh, I, it's not on the, on the screen, but um, there's more money for the FHWA Highway Safety Improvement Program, uh, and also a Safe Streets and Roads for All program. This is a huge new uh, highway safety grant program for localities which I'll discuss in just a few minutes. So the major structural change that Congress is making for our members and all of our members grantees is a switch from an annual highway safety plan cycle to a triennial highway safety plan cycle. Uh, so uh, I can walk through uh, what's gonna happen over the next couple of years. So right now we are in a uh, federal this year, 2022, states are wrapping that up and they've already submitted their highway safety plans for federal fiscal year 2023. Uh, which will begin uh, October 1st. And under both of these years, uh, states are still operating under the FAST Act rules and just submitting single annual highway safety plans. Although you will notice that there's increased, uh, an increased amount of funding that's already taken effect uh, that our states are taking advantage of. However, uh, beginning next spring, uh, states are gonna be going to be preparing the first triennial highway safety plan that should be due in July 1st of next year. Uh, this plan will cover each of the following uh, federal fiscal years, uh, wrapping up the end of uh, 2026. Uh, so the, the Triennial High HSP is meant to be more of like a program plan. Uh, we anticipate that in this plan, you will see states identifying the highway safety problems that they're seeing in their states, setting performance measures and targets, and talking at the high level about all the different things that they plan to do over the ensuing three years. And then uh, it, it, as part of the first year plan, and then in the second and third year, states will also submit what is being called an annual grant application, which will be more project focused. There'll be all the information about the individual projects that states are, um, are making uh, within each of these years, as well as some other stuff that's going to be required uh, by law. Um, states will also have continue to submit an annual report uh, today uh, after the end of each fiscal year. Uh, states submit this report explaining uh, how everything went, um, what, what were the impacts of the programs that they've implemented, and how are they doing on performance. Uh, the infrastructure bill changed some of the provisions of that annual report. Uh, it also uh, changed some deadlines. So Drani LHSP will be due on July 1st every uh, of the year, uh, every three years. Um, but the annual grant application will also be due on an annual basis, and uh, Congress did not set a due date for that, and we've urged NHTSA to push that back a little bit later into the summer because uh, states, uh, uh, many states typically have their highway safety plans before they've outlined all their projects. We're hoping that extra time will be helpful. And then for the annual report, uh, today it's due December 31st, which is a kind of an administrative headache for states having to prepare that around the holiday time, but the uh, bill has extended that uh, further into the following fiscal year. So it'll probably be due in the uh, January, February timeframe, giving the state highway safety offices a little bit more time to prepare the annual annual report piece. Uh, so there are a couple different buckets of funding that states take advantage of from NHTSA and then apply at the state and local level. Uh, one of them, section 402, this is a huge uh, bucket of funding. It's about half of the funding, the grant funding that states have access to from NHTSA, and states have a lot of flexibility in how they can spend this money, and it's allocated by formula. 
and it's the it's the the, the oldest uh, highway safety grant uh, that's out there, and it's money that's given to states to address the problems that they identify in their highway safety plans. And uh, but even within that, there is a list of of allowable uses, meaning things that states can use this grant funding for. And uh, what Congress did in the infrastructure bill is to go back and take a look at those allowable uses and adding, add some new ones. Uh, so you will see up there on screen, uh, misunderstanding new vehicle tech, particularly automated vehicle technology that's becoming more and more popular. Uh, recall awareness has been a big issue over the last several years. Uh, children in hot cars, slow down rover, it's not a, not a new issue, but uh, something that's, that's still happening. Um, so uh, Congress wanted to make sure that states have the flexibility to address many of these emerging issues uh, that, that really, are, I mean, to be honest, we're already dealing with. Um, there's another reform in uh, the uh, rules surrounding automated enforcement. So right now, federal law prohibits uh, states from using NHTSA funding to implement automated enforcement programs. But the bill changes that uh, beginning in uh, FY 2024, uh, states will be allowed to use federal fund for speed and red light camera enforcement in school and work zones. Uh, so it, so that's, that's really exciting. I think it remains to be seen uh, how much states will take advantage of this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to really depend on the other kinds of uh, program requirements that NHTSA will impose. Um, and of course, automated enforcement itself is still uh, somewhat of a controversial matter <laughs> nationwide. So hopefully more to come on that. Um, I, uh, you'll see section 402. Section 403 is a different section of law that relates to NHTSA's internal program and research activities. And there's an increase in funding there as well. I wanna flag two things. The first is to increase funding for the Behavioral Traffic Safety Cooperative Research Program or BTSCRP, BITSCREP. It's the only uh, federal cooperative research program focused on behavioral highway traffic safety issues. We have to increase funding for that. And as well as increased funding for the DADS research program. Stephanie may talk a little bit more about this, but it's a, a, uh, an ongoing federal research program on uh, passive alcohol detection technology. And uh, so recognizing the, uh, uh, how that's going, they want to, to continue the investment there. Uh, throughout the bill, uh, throughout the bill, and throughout the process of developing the bill, there was a lot of conversation about equity and highway safety. This, of course, is connected to the broader conversation about equity in policing and the role of law enforcement uh, nationwide. Um, and there were some voices in there that that were recommending some really destructive changes to NHTSA's grant programs. Would effectively shut down many of NHTSA's grants. Uh, but uh, Congress decided not to go in that direction. We worked with our partners with NHTSA to try and. Uh, and insert some provisions we think will be a little bit more constructive. For example, there is a grant program known as Section 1906 that provides funding to states to set up traffic stop data collection programs. Uh, Congress has increased funding for that and removed some other uh, roadblocks uh, to, to, to states uh, applying for that grant and uh, implementing it. Um, so we're expecting a lot of states to begin investing in, in those kinds of data collection initiatives, um, some changes uh, uh, to the kinds of countermeasures that this is going to be looking at and researching, hoping to expand um, the menu of proven countermeasures beyond uh, just traffic enforcement to other kinds of approaches as well. And finally, there are some requirements that all highway safety plans are going to have to integrate um, including demonstration of meaningful community engagement in the planning process uh, for highway safety plans and, and highway safety programs, as well as some level of data collection related to traffic enforcement. Uh, we're, kind, we're still kind of working through the details with NHTSA about what exactly that will mean. I know that uh, it, it's beyond the means of many states to immediately launch a comprehensive traffic stop data collection program in the near term, but it's certainly something we want to work towards if we can. So if that's going to be an ongoing conversation and, and with, with the renewed um, uh, availability of 1906, I, I imagine many states are going to go in that direction as well. One notable change relates to performance management. So states set performance targets for uh, the progress they hope to make. And what has been happening over the last several years is states will crunch the data and they will say, well, it, uh, it looks like traffic fatalities are most likely going to increase. So we're going to set a target based on, on that data. And so uh, some have watched, latched onto that saying, well, states are just uh, setting targets, expecting fatalities to increase, or they, they want fatalities to increase or something like that which is, is, a, is a real um, uh, mischaracterization of what's going on. But nonetheless, Congress was responsive to, to some of these concerns. And so moving forward, beginning in 2024, states uh, performance targets uh, must demonstrate constant or improved performance. So in other words, states can no longer um, set a target that expects fatalities to, incre to increase 
uh, seatbelt used to go down or other kinds of metrics that uh, are headed in the wrong direction. Um, so we're working with NHTSA uh, on that, uh, ASHO, and the state duties are also very much interested in that because some of the performance measurement and uh, target setting impacts them as well. So we're hoping to collaborate uh, with ASHTO, with FHWA and NHTSA to come up with some sort of arrangement where states can be compliant with this new provision, but also continue to implement data-driven programs and uh, data-driven performance management pro systems. Uh, the other major- hey, hey Russ, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but your slides are not in advancing. Oh, uh, I'm clicking on the wrong screen. Uh, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, here is the section on 402 uh, changes. Um, you can see the allowable uses for section 402. I mentioned many of them, and then some of the other changes that were there. Uh, equity provisions. Uh, I mentioned section 1906 and the increase in funding and some of the, the policy provision changes. And then some of the new requirements in section 402 related to equity, public participation, uh, law enforcement data collection. This is, I, I pulled the text directly from the law and we're working through with NHTSA on, again, working through with NHTSA exactly what all this will mean. I mentioned performance management uh, or uh, moving forward, uh, constant and improved performance is the name of the game. Uh, and you can see uh, this this graphic doesn't really mean anything, but we're gonna we're gonna work through with NHTSA how we can uh, how we can uh, make sure the states remain compliant with that. So, catching up, here's where we left off. So uh, let's turn to Section 405. Uh, Section 405 is the other other major bucket of NHTSA grant funding, and unlike Section 402, um, Section 405 has many subsections, individual uh, incentive grants or national priority grants that are focused on specific highway safety issues, as you can see on screen. And uh, there, were, there were a number of major changes here. Uh, perhaps the most notable is they eliminated section 405G on teen driver safety. This was a grant that was established, I think in 2012, and states had to have a, a, a long list of compliant graduated driver licensing law provisions. And many states have uh, very strong GDL laws, but no states had all of them in order to qualify for this grant. I think of all the states, maybe New Jersey came the closest, but uh, given that no state had ever qualified for this grant, we worked with our partners. We all kind of agreed that we could uh, invest this money better elsewhere. And so um, we worked with Congress to base it out. And that's not to say that teen driver safety and graduated driver's licensing are not very important. In fact, all states continue to have very strong teen driver safety programs. And we certainly would encourage everyone to continue to invest in that area, but there just won't, will no longer be this set aside of funding uh, hypothetically available for states to take advantage of. Uh, throughout section 405, some other uh, administrative changes um, within tra the traffic records, impaired driving and non-motorized grants, we worked with Congress to radically expand a lot of the uses, but we found that a lot of states were running into roadblocks programming that funding because of the way the law was written for various reasons. And so we wanted to allow states to uh, invest in the kind of programs that they want to invest in, but they weren't able to before. So hopefully we'll see a lot more uh, activity in traffic records and impaired driving, particularly drug impaired driving and, and, and um, a lot of the tools and technologies and programs that are emerging to address that. And then uh, no, non-motorized uh, highway safety as well, uh, reflecting the fact that it's no longer just pedestrians and bicyclists, but a whole wide range of different mobility options that are out there. And there's a lot of opportunities for state highway safety offices and their grantees to become more involved within those programs. And um, this, there's a lot here uh, within section 405 for these individual grants. So um, in the interest of time, I'll just say, if anyone has any questions about them, I'd be glad to address them, but uh, let's move on for, for now. All right. So. Uh, there are some new grant opportunities that are going to be available for states. Um, Congress is setting aside $300 million a year for $300 million per year for the National Center for Statistics and Analysis. It's kind of the wing of NHTSA that deals with uh, crash data and national fatality numbers and aggregating all that information. And um, they're going to be working on internal efforts to uh, upgrade uh, traffic records uh, stuff at NHTSA, but there's also a a new grant program that they are setting up to, uh, that's going to be available for states. And this is in addition to the traffic records grant that I just uh, mentioned on the last slide. This is money on top of that. Uh, you may have seen a notice of, uh, actually it was a request for public comment that NHTSA published a couple of months ago asking for input on this grant. So we'll hopefully we'll see some more details about what this opportunity will mean for states sometime in the near future. Uh, there's a new grant program for vehicle, vehicle recall awareness, which of course is an ongoing concern. And then the new Safe Streets and Roads for All program. So hopefully you've heard a little bit about this. Uh, the Secretary's Office at USDOT has been very active trying to uh, raise awareness about this grant opportunity, but really it's uh, a, a little over a billion dollars per year that's going to be, be distributed competitively to local governments to implement Vision Zero type programs. And so, uh, if, 
tremendous opportunity, a, a lot of excitement. If you are on, if you're on today's webinar and you are a local government authority, uh, I hope you're thinking about whether or not you might want to apply for this grant. And for those of you on the state level, I think it's still an opportunity for you to work with your local partners uh, to uh, to help them apply for this. It might be the first time they've applied directly for federal funding, and uh, also to make sure that you're coordinating everything um, on both the state and local level. Uh, we want to try and, of course, make the most of this new opportunity that we can together. So, uh, some miscellaneous changes, um, a, a lot of stuff in vehicle safety, meaning uh, new federal motor vehicle safety standards that NHTSA has been directed to uh, create on a wide range of uh, vehicle equipment, safety equipment uh, issues. Uh, Stephanie, I know, is going to go take a deep dive into the Ride Act, uh, but uh, we're very excited about that change as well. Uh, she updates to the new car assessment program, which is NHTSA, uh, you, you may know of it as the uh, five star rating uh, program that NHTSA puts out to, uh, uh, to test new cars with crash tests. Uh, a lot of changes within FMCSA, some new grant programs. There's been a big debate over underride guards, and there's some new requirement for truck underride guards to hopefully prevent those kinds of crashes, or at least mitigate the impact of those crashes. Uh, there's been a, a rather controversial pilot program for um, providing commercial vehicle, uh, actually commercial driver licensing to drivers under age 21, uh, but, uh, but FMCSA is moving forward with a pilot program on that, so there's a lot, a lot there to discuss. Um, on the FHWA side, uh, one interesting thing is under the Highway Safety Improvement Program, Congress has restored the ability for states to flex up to 10% of HSIP funding for non-infrastructure projects. So that is between the State Highway Safety Office and the State DOT in every state to work out uh, how they're going to uh, tackle that. But uh, that, that opportunity is there as well. There's also a lot of stuff in HSIP related to vulnerable road users and um, some other changes uh, all, all that you can see that uh, will be helpful for safety and that uh, I'd be happy to uh, discuss in greater detail. So where we are in the, moving back to NHTSA, where we are in the development of the regulation, they're, what they're doing right now is updating the regular, they're, they're taking the, what, what has been passed in the infrastructure law in the fall and translating that into regulations for states to begin to implement to, to submit their highway safety plans under these new rules. And what we've asked and what NHTSA has agreed to as a goal is to promulgate a final rule by the end of the year, because if you remember, states have to, will have to submit their first triennial highway safety plans in July, by July 1st of next year. And so they need time to figure all that out. So we're hoping that if we can get this final rule in place by the end of this calendar year, that states will have a good six months to, uh, to process the changes, and fully develop their uh, their new three-year high-risk safety plans. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, NHTSA has told us that the, the goal is to have a notice of proposed rulemaking, which is basically a full draft set of rules for everyone to review and comment on, releasing that sometime in the fall, maybe as early as next month. Uh, so when that is released, when that MPRM is released, uh, uh, GHSA plans to submit detailed comments uh, on behalf of our membership. And, and we'd of course encourage how we, how we see the offices, uh, stake, uh, any stakeholder that's involved anywhere in the NHTSA grant ecosystem to, uh, to take a look at that and, and share your comments because your, your input is, is highly valued there as well. So that is my presentation. I know I've uh, uh, went over uh, some stuff rather quickly, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, but I want to uh, just say that uh, you know, I'm happy to, to answer any questions and I want to thank uh, TZD for inviting us to have chat today. Thank you, Russ. That was great. Uh, this is Linda Dolan with the Minnesota TZD program. Come on, and, uh, are you back on, Brian? Come on. Awesome. Great. Let me share my screen for Stephanie. Had a minor glitch there, but I'm back. So thank you, Russ. We really appreciate you joining us this morning. And just a reminder for everyone to submit any questions you have for Russ using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And our next speaker is Stephanie Manning. Chief Government Affairs Officer at Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Stephanie has specialized in traffic safety policy for more than 25 years. She's worked on policies related to both behavioral safety and vehicle safety, including the establishment of a national 0.08 blood alcohol concentration stand standard and legislation to mandate advanced drunk driving prevention technology. Throughout her career, she has served as the Director of Federal Affairs for MAD, a senior policy advisor for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and as a transportation consultant. Thank you for joining us this morning, Stephanie. I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say I was going to share the sound when I shared my screen to make sure I can run a clip, but it wouldn't let me. So it might I might need to retry it because somebody else was sharing screen. So I'm going to stop sharing and just try one more time. 
Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for bearing with me. Yeah, I'm not able to hit it like I was in the other session. Um, I'm not sure why, but I'll just go ahead and um, we'll see if we can figure it out as we go. Okay, um, so I, I'm not sure if I'll be able to play the video, but um, I my guess is the slides will be made available to everybody. And if not, I can certainly make them available to anybody interested in seeing the part of the presentation you may not be able to hear for technology reasons. Okay, so um, uh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the invitation to talk about um, this really important issue, <clears throat> uh, what we were, many of us in the safety community were able to achieve in the IIJA, uh, which is a rulemaking, a mandate for advanced impaired driving prevention technology. And I'm not sure why this, there we go. Okay. So how did we get here? Um, what does the law mean? Where do we go from here? So let's talk about the essential deliverables in the law, uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, as a result of this rulemaking mandated from Congress, must establish a final safety technology standard within the required time frame in the law, which I'll talk about in a moment. So this means that U.S. auto manufacturers must install life-saving technology as standard equipment in all new cars within the law's timeline. So technology is really our turning point in the war on drunk driving and all forms of impairment. Uh, which, of course, means other types of drugs and potentially even fatigue, distraction, reckless driving. Um, our purposes for today's discussion are impairment due to alcohol and other drugs. Um, it's, it's really important to note, first of all, that as probably most of you know, we're seeing historic increases, not just in alcohol-related traffic deaths, but in all traffic deaths. And actually, this morning, um, at the NHTSA Drive Sober or Get Pulled Over um, kickoff event, which we have a MAD victim survivor and staff member participating in, NHTSA is going to announce um, another increase. Um, and it's, it's really challenging, I think, for all of us on this webinar who work in this field and who uh, are really passionate about the work we do to hear about these recent increases. It's now a trend, right, that we're moving in the wrong direction. And the fact is we're, we're now at almost 43,000 deaths every year. Um, we're at 10,000 more deaths a year than we were a decade ago. This is truly a national crisis in terms of alcohol-related deaths and all traffic fatalities. So when we're talking about this particular issue and um, technology to stop impaired driving, we first at MAD had a, a symposium in 2006 with then Senator Udall in New Mexico and the auto industry representatives from the Auto Alliance who were there talking about, again, back in 2006, how we can use technology, advanced technology, not interlocks, that's a different type of technology, but built into vehicles, um, so a driver, you know, will not be hindered in any way. Won't even, you know, recognize. Won't have to do anything proactively. Uh, you know, just get in your car like you do today um, and drive, assuming that you're not impaired. We talked about this with the industry in 2006, so that gives you an idea as to how long we've been having this discussion, how long we've been fighting, um, and how long we've been talking to policymakers about this. The problem was there's really no sense of urgency from the automakers. Um, there have been many promises made over the years, many announcements made over the years, but the bottom line is the industry doesn't feel that this is their responsibility to solve this problem. Um, there are a lot, there's, there's probably a list of a hundred reasons I could give you as to why the industry has not um, moved forward um, in a way that really solves the problem, even though the technology exists. Uh, and, and we'll get into some of that now. So the solution really from a victim survivor perspective, and again, I, I'm the chief government affairs officer, but I, whenever I speak on webinars or whenever I'm meeting with members of Congress, uh, members of the administration, state legislatures, whether I'm with a victim or victim survivor or not, I really represent millions of victims and survivors, people who have been seriously injured themselves in crashes due to impairment, or people who have lost loved ones due to impairment. Um, people who really should never have joined this club that we call you know, the Victim Survivor Club at MAD. Nobody wants to be a part of this club. So the only solution to the lack of action on the part of the auto industry was 
our victims and survivors going to Capitol Hill virtually during COVID after many, many years of, of seeking solutions uh, proactively, we sought a federal standard. And uh, it is a two-step process. First, it was the legislation, and now it's the regulation. So I wanna point out that, uh, and I can quickly touch on the legislative campaign, but we had polls done during the campaign and we asked questions that were not leading, that didn't look like they were written from MAD, that uh, really wanted to create a baseline of where does the public really stand on some technology solution to impaired driving? And we at MAD were really truly surprised that the support was overwhelming. Um, of course, there are concerns with public acceptance that are going to need, need to be worked out. Um, things, you know, I can bring up proactively on this call because they usually come up on every webinar that I do or every meeting I have. Privacy concerns, will law enforcement be involved? We've got ways to answer all of these questions. Um, and and the, the bottom line is, unless the public accepts this technology, it's not gonna happen. So we at MAD are just as concerned about all of these you know, issues that are raised, um, both by our opponents who have fought us uh, on the Hill and are gonna fight us through the regulatory process. Um, we need to make sure that the public continues to accept um, and here's, you know, solid answers from our organization and a lot of others that have come to the table to help us get this done. The public overwhelmingly accepts um, and supports this federal action. So it became this bipartisan legislative effort, the HALT Drunk Driving Act in the House and in the Senate, the RIDE Act. It's important to note that the HALT Drunk Driving Act was named in honor of the Abbas family. I was just actually messaging with a member of the Abbas family right before this call. Uh, we're in touch daily, uh, weekly at, at minimum. Um, the Abbas family and specifically Rena Abbas Taylor lost her entire family of five, her sister, her sister's husband and their three young children in a wrong way drunk driving crash on their way back from vacation in Florida through Kentucky as they were heading home to Michigan. Why is that significant and why did that help us uh, achieve this? Um, the Abbas family uh, has ties to the Michigan delegation, which is the seat of the US auto industry. And um, it brought the Michigan congressional delegation to the table. So in addition to the Abbas family getting activated and you know, just for perspective, there were 7,000 people at the Abbas family funeral and every member of that Michigan delegation in attendance. Um, and traditionally they represent, you know, the Michigan delegation represents the auto industry in Congress. That's their job. Um, but this crash was national and uh, was so devastating to so many people in the Dearborn community um, that people couldn't turn away. Uh, and knowing that the technology exists and that this is possible for the auto industry to solve, um, it really gave a lot of, uh, uh, impetus for this effort to move forward. In addition to about a hundred people that we had from across the country on war room calls every week that we pulled together uh, victims and survivors from across the country to contact members of Congress on you know significant committees of jurisdiction to share their stories. And that's really the power of MAD. When we bring victims and survivors to meet with their members, that's how we got the age 21 law done. That's how we got the national point of weight BAC standard done and a lot of other legislation that I know all of you are familiar with. So the fact that this was bipartisan was hugely significant. Um, you know, the margins are really tight in Congress and the negotiations that were going on around the IIJA were really, um, you know, Republicans and Democrats had to work very closely together. And this was one of the only mandates that actually made it through. Um, the other thing to note is it is one of the most significant rulemakings that NHTSA will ever undertake in terms of the potential lives saved. Um, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety uh, estimates that 9,400 lives could be saved every year uh, when this is fully implemented and the tech is on all cars. Um, we now feel that that's unfortunately a lower estimate because the numbers are moving in the wrong direction. And we're now almost at 12,000 lives lost every year due to just the alcohol related piece. We haven't even talked about the poly use piece and marijuana and other types of drugs combined with alcohol 
that uh, amplifies the impacts of all of these drugs. Um, so a quick moment to say thank you to a lot of the folks, uh, both nonprofits, uh, GHSA is one of them that supported this effort um, and lent their name and influence to this along with us, along with the insurance industry. And you'll notice the alcohol industry, which was very new for MAD. Um, we had never worked alongside some segments of the alcohol industry in this way. But I think when the industry and, and many different partners that you see on the screen, National Safety Council, GHSA and others, Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety, when a lot of the safety community and a lot of different um, you know, industries saw what we were talking about and we were able to bring to light that the industry is able to solve this through technology, um, they were on board. You know, I think the bottom line is nobody wants drug driving to happen. Nobody wants there to be death and injury from the problem. It's just that nobody agrees on how to solve it. Uh, so I just wanted to take a moment to highlight that we we did have a very large group of people, uh, of companies and interests that were very clearly interested in solving this problem with us, even people that we traditionally hadn't worked with in the past. So let's take a moment uh, to talk about the regulatory process that we're now you know, nine months into. NHTSA has three years to evaluate technologies and issue a final safety standard. Automakers then have two to three years to implement the new safety standard. New cars will then be equipped with the NHTSA directed technology and could start rolling off the assembly line in 2026 to 2027, those are the earliest dates. Now there is also a provision in the law that would allow NHTSA to go back to Congress and do a report after the initial three years of evaluating technologies and having to issue the final rule and say they need addition, an additional year. And they can do that for up to three years. So this time frame could move another three years forward. Uh, but by 2030, uh, certainly Matt, from Matt's perspective, well before then, we will expect to see uh, impaired driving <clears throat> prevention technology start rolling off of the assembly lines. We also feel that this time frame is extremely generous, given that we've been talking with the industry about this since 2006. Uh, and I'm going to share with you some of the technologies in a moment that we feel NHTSA needs to consider. Um, and some of the other ways that MAD has um, looked to engage in the regulatory process, which, by the way, this is not something that MAD has ever done before. We've never been involved in a vehicle safety issue like this before. We've tended to focus on the on the behavioral side, click it or ticket, drive sober, get pulled over, fair and equitable enforcement, um, you know, getting strong laws and strong enforcement of those laws. So the fact that MAD is involved in a regulatory issue on the vehicle side is new, but also very compelling because we have so many victims and survivors um, ready to engage in this process in a way that I don't think uh, has ever happened before on the regulatory front. Certainly there have been victims and survivors engaged on other types of regulatory actions, but not quite um, in this, you know, way with as many victims and survivors engaged. Um, so let's talk about the technology. This is what everybody really wants to hear about. There are three basic tech categories that MAD believes that NHTSA needs to consider as part of this rulemaking process. Um, systems like ADAS uh, that monitor the vehicle's movement. And a lot of these systems are available on probably many of your cars today, including lane keeping assist and emergency braking. Basically actions that the car can take if the car, if the car systems knows that the car is now taking you into a dangerous uh, maneuver and can correct your driving. Again, a lot of these systems are already available on cars. The industry also in a lot of cases likes to upcharge for these features, charging several thousand dollars for the latest advanced safety systems. We feel that that's an equity issue and that everybody should have access to the same safe um, systems that the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety will say, if you have this system on your car, your chances of being involved in a serious crash go down by X percentage. If you have this system in your car, your chances of being involved in a serious crash go down by X percentage. There's a whole list of those types of features. We feel they should be standard on all vehicles and that everybody should be safe in their cars. Then there's driver monitoring systems that monitor the condition of the driver that can tell, for instance, uh, and there's, there's systems that are already being marketed, a lot of them in Europe and Asia, uh, but here as well, fatigue prevention systems that can tell if the driver is asleep. 
um, distraction uh, prevention systems that can tell if the, the eyes of the driver are off the road for a certain period of time, reckless driving prevention technologies. Uh, they can tell if the hands of the driver are off the wheel. There, there's combinations of systems that the industry has already rolled out that can tell if the driver can safely operate the vehicle. And then there's what everybody is familiar with in this discussion, which is passive alcohol detection systems. They can determine whether the driver is legally drunk and then prevent the vehicle from moving. And that's traditionally what is, is you know, what people know as the DADS program, the driver alcohol Syst detection system for safety. One thing I want to say is we are not talking about breathalyzers. These are not related to police breathalyzers in any way, shape or form. We're talking about passive systems. We at Matter Technology Neutral, um, we really don't have a, a stake in the game in terms of what type of technology or more likely technology system is, uh, is, is installed in vehicles. We just want impaired driving deaths and injuries to stop. That is our only interest. And we do not think that police need to be involved in this. We don't want to scare people. This is not a cop on board scenario. We don't want people's uh, private data uh, or information on driving habits shared. Again, our only interest is in stopping these deaths and injuries from happening. Some argue that it's years away. This is not true. We found hundreds of examples of tech that NHTSA could consider as part of the rulemaking process. I've talked about DADS. I'm going to just kind of pick it up a little bit in the interest of time. Um, but the DADS program uh, is this public-private partnership, and a prototype was unveiled at the MAD National Conference in 2015. At that time, the DADS program stated it would be available on cars in five years. We know that's no longer the case because we're past that time frame. Uh, but we've been talking about this, and, and the federal government has been investing in this technology, in this research, and the auto industry um, has essentially been running it for a long time. And the DADS program has more recently said uh, that the breath-based system uh, will be available in 2024 and the touch-based system will be available um, in 2025, which is fantastic. That's well within the statutory and regulatory timeline mandated by Congress. So really quickly, I'm going to just run through the existing technology, just some highlights of what we feel is important to note. Europe is much more ahead of us in terms of um, technology and its capabilities with impairment. So take a look at this tweet from Euro NCAP that I think happened, I don't, I don't remember exactly when I should have had the date on here. Oh, September 8th, 2021. The all new but conventionally powered Subaru Outback achieves an outstanding score of 95% for safety assist. The car is equipped with a system which detects signs of fatigue or impairment directly from the driver's eye movements and combines this with steering behavior. So we're seeing tweets like this and information in other countries in Europe and Asia as we in the United States, the industry here still talks about why this is not possible and why we cannot install technology that will prevent impaired driving. We know this isn't true uh, and we're just gonna keep sort of monitoring what's happening in other countries and bring that to NHTSA's attention and keep talking about it until it's a reality here in this country. Um, I later have a video I could play, but I think because of the sound issues, I won't, um, and also just in the interest of time. But there's a video link on my presentation that all of you can look at on your own time that actually shows in 2019, Volvo announced its plans to deploy in-car cameras and sensors that actually do exactly what we're talking about. Again, this was on the Volvo European manufacturer website. And here in this country, um, the US uh, arm, of the auto industry denied that this technology can be used for driver intoxication. The press announcement from Volvo and the video that is still on Volvo Europe's website, and I have a link to it later in the presentation, clearly shows that they can do this. Um, and our, you know, our position with NHTSA is talk to Volvo, talk with all these manufacturers, find out what their testing standards are, find out what the algorithms are that they're using to determine when to pull the car over, um, and when the risk goes up uh, in terms of some of the um, behaviors that you see, they, the auto industry has figured out where those lines of delineation are. We just have to, you know, sort of get on board here in this country and figure out what, you know, what that looks like in terms of a standard. 
Hey, Stephanie, this yeah. is Linda. I was able to put the link in the chat box so people can see it there. And also you Great. have a couple more minutes. Okay. Thanks so much, Linda. I appreciate it. Um, a couple more examples. I'll just run through and get to one more here. Uh, Nissan actually put this out in 2007. This was a, a diagrams and descriptions in the media too of a concept car with multiple preventative features against drunk driving, including alcohol sensors, a facial monitoring system and driver behavior monitoring. Again, this was in 2007. So again, if you, you do the math on what we're talking about here, we're talking about getting this tech on cars in 2024, 2025. Think about how far cars have come in terms of technology advancements and the technology revolution happening right now, the industry is testing cars on open roads in some states without a steering wheel. They don't even need a driver for some of these autonomous vehicles. And the industry continues to say they can't solve impaired driving. Toyota, same thing in 2007, it was covered in the news. I include a link later in my presentation uh, on a news story um, in Asia that uh, is done in English. Um, about Toyota's system on impaired driving and specifically alcohol. Here are the notable links. This is the last part I will talk about. Um, if you can click on the link from Hyundai on your own time, this is a quote that just came out July, 2022. It will also be possible to detect if the driver is intoxicated and block the driver from driving. Hyundai Mobis's breathalyzer technology is a non-contact type that can measure just by exhaling a little. It uses optical sensor technology to detect the alcohol content in the driver's breath to determine the BAC. This tech is more accurate and convenient than electrochemical sensors that require mouth-to-mouth -mouth blowing. This is the first time that a, uh, a major manufacturer, an auto manufacturer, has specifically said, we can do this. Uh, and this was just in July. Uh, Volvo's announcement was driver monitoring behavior. This is specifically um, detecting alcohol uh, BAC and driver monitoring. It's a combination. Last thing is we at MAD, along with Johns Hopkins, put together a technical working group, an independent body of experts to uh, start meetings. We met in July. We're meeting again in October to invite suppliers and manufacturers to sit down and talk with us about ways to solve this problem so that we can help NHTSA identify technologies and potentially help them figure out what a standard might look like and to also focus on public acceptance and any concerns that the public might have um, with, with this technology because we do need to make sure it works. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, if you're a victim or survivor and would like to get involved in this effort, you can email us at policyatmad.org. We also have a 24 hour victim helpline and thank you so much for your time. Awesome, thank you, Stephanie. Really appreciate you joining us this morning. Um, and once again, a reminder for everyone to submit any questions you have for Stephanie using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, I had some technical issues, so I can't see the questions, so I'm gonna need some help. Um, I do have a question, I do have a couple of my own for the panelists. So uh, when we get to that point, uh, I might need a little bit of assistance. Um, and so with this, I'm going to introduce our final speaker, Mike Hansen. Um, Mike has been the director of the Department of Public Safety's Office of Traffic Safety since October 2017 and is the designated Governor's Highway Safety Representative for the state of Minnesota. Prior to being appointed as the director of the Office of Traffic Safety, Mike served with the Minnesota State Patrol, retiring from the State Patrol in 2017 with nearly 35 years of law enforcement experience. During his tenure with State Patrol, Mike worked in the Marshall, Mankato, Minneapolis, Detroit Lakes, and Thief River Falls District, finishing his career with State Patrol as the district commander for the West Metropolitan District. Mike has specialized in several areas of service, including as crash reconstruction specialist, DWI and SFST trainer instructor, field training officer, mobile field force co-commander, and as an IACP leadership training facilitator. I know firsthand how passionate Mike is about traffic safety issues and public safety services. And I know I speak for Mark Kendi in saying we're honored to have the privilege of serving as co-chairs of the Minnesota TZD program together with Mike. And I wanna thank you for joining us for some hot dish this morning, Mike. Hey, thanks, Brian. I'm glad to be here. And thank everybody uh, for uh, taking some time to join us today for what is really a timely topical discussion 
Um, you know, I've heard Colonel Langer say in the past, the technology will eventually save us from ourselves. And what we're looking at here is really, I think, the first chapters of, of that. We've seen some of the ADAS systems that have come out. Um, as uh, Stephanie uh, just presented on, the next generation is about to come out. Uh, and along with that is the extensive support that the IJA legislation will provide for behavioral traffic safety, as well as for a number of other related areas. So I, I don't want to duplicate Russ's uh, um, uh, presentation. So I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a Minnesota spin on this. And this is what I think many in, in the audience are, are looking for is how is IJA uh, really going to affect us, you know, our boots on the ground and on our day-to-day -day operations uh, through the TZD program and uh, how will all of our stakeholders be affected? Well, Lydia, you want to hop to the next one? As Russ said, most of the significant changes occur in 2024. With that being said, we are already at OTS beginning to plan because once this goes into effect, we need to have all of our ducks in a row to be able to take full advantage of everything that IJA is gonna to mean to Minnesota traffic safety. Again, as Russ said, we will see an increase for funding levels in many of our program areas and along with that, much greater flexibility, which is really important as we've seen over the last two and a half years in Minnesota. We need to be able to pivot and we need to uh, be able to be innovative and creative to address new and rapidly emerging trends. Next one up, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, in our impaired driving section, one of the biggest changes that came out of IJA is the reduced restrictions for what we call our section 164 funds. This is a significant uh, pot of money that we share with our partners at MnDOT. Um, and in the past, we've only been able to take about $7 million worth of our funding and use it for alcohol only impaired driving enforcement. Well, as we all realize, uh, drug impaired driving is becoming a much more significant challenge on Minnesota roads. So every time we put an impaired driving program out there, we had to split fund that between our 164 alcohol funds and our 405D uh, drug impaired fund. Now we're able to use um, those 164 funds for uh, just about anything impaired related. So what this means, we'll see more media outreach and education coming out of our communication shop. There is a significant potential to increase of uh, one of our most successful programs, which is the DWI officer program. Currently, we sponsor 24 or 25 officers across the state, and that's all they focus on, and that's the activity that we fund. Uh, we'll be able to expand our support for the DWI courts and for some of the additional court projects that can and do reduce recidivism in a very real way. And then we'll be able to expand our greater impaired driving enforcement grants and hopefully be able to include some more equipment with some of those. Next one, Linda. Traffic records, um, and again, as Russ said, traffic records in the past, uh, the funding, and it's not insignificant, has been historically very difficult for us to spend because the parameters that were laid out in the NHTSA rules were very narrow and very detailed. Um, we, we did manage to make good use of a lot of that funding, but under IJA, it will become much more flexible and it will uh, really allow us to expand what our traffic records coordinating committee is able to do. And it's important to remember, this is not just MinCrash, because even under the old restrictions, we were able to embark upon projects with the BCA, with Driver and Vehicle Services, with MnDOT, and with the Department of Health. And so the additional flexibility that we're going to realize through IJA will allow us to expand those. And we have a couple of big projects um, that we're working with our MnDOT and Department of Health partners on, and with our partners at the BCA that can have really significant effects if we look down the road two to three years and look at big data analysis and even analytics programs that may help us to predict and therefore prevent some of the challenges that we're currently faced with. And a big internal benefit, um, because I, I'm sure most of you are unaware of all of the work that went into our triennial traffic records program assessment. Uh, it took up a lot of staff time and it was a very arduous task. So the fact that that was eliminated, that is uh, a big time saver uh, for us at uh, the OTS office. Uh, next one, Linda. Some of the other changes that are coming. 
Um, as Russ touched on, you know, teen driver safety grants through NHTSA were notoriously, well, impossible to qualify for because the, uh, while their well-intentioned requirements were, were just so difficult to meet that no states were able to qualify for it. Now in Minnesota, we have, and we will continue to support a very robust teen driver safety program. Cat Vu is our coordinator in that area, and we will continue to support CAT's work um, using other federal funds as well as potentially some state funds uh, if we are successful with a couple of our legislative initiatives. So that's going to continue. We'll see a large increase in the coming years in our non-motorized safety programs. And uh, long and short of it, I, as I envision this, this is gonna be a combination of some extra money for enforcement, both on the pedestrian side and on the motorist side, but also for some significant education and outreach programs. Now, granted, just because of the nature of these, some of these will be in our larger urban areas, uh, but if anybody has a significant problem, and I know there are specific areas across the state uh, that will uh, qualify for this, bring those ideas to us and we will construct a program to help address those localized issues. A couple of them that are new and are very near and dear to my heart, first of all, is the roadside safety for first responders. These grants are really gonna allow us to take the traffic incident management best practices um, and roll those out in a very meaningful and very effective way across the state. Um, we do have a, a fairly successful TIM program in Minnesota currently, but we're getting ready to embark upon a, a really dramatic uh, improvement in what we're seeing with that. And that will include education for first responders and also education and outreach for motorists. Uh, because our goal in the goal of traffic incident management, get the right equipment there, get it there timely, get everything done that needs to be done and get off the road. Because if we can reduce the exposure of all of our first responders, it's gonna be a lot safer for everybody out there. And then there's also additional funding uh, for traffic stop safety education. And this includes both uh, uh, education and outreach for officers, as well as those officers interact with that roadside. Now we do have a pretty good program in Minnesota through the driver's education section at PVS. That, that does touch on this, but this is gonna allow us to take that up uh, to the, uh, the next level. Now, beyond the, the behavior uh, related programs that I've highlighted so far that OTS has, uh, it's important to keep in mind that MnDOT is also going to realize some significant increases um, in their safety programming funding for infrastructure. And so a lot of that work is still being hammered out um, and uh, as the rules are developed, but look for that uh, to come down the pike as well. And um, finally, um, Russ uh, Martin is a very modest gentleman. And um, I would really like to give a huge shout out and a recognition to Russ for all of the work that he put into uh, helping to craft IIJA. Uh, it can't be said strongly enough how important GHSA's role in that and Russ having the lead in that um, really made a significant difference in the freedom and the flexibility that state highway safety offices and all of us are going to have moving forward with the IJA funding. Um, and then Stephanie, obviously a great advocate uh, for anything uh, uh, from the MAD end of it and in the prevention aspect uh, when it comes to those impaired drivers. So uh, thanks everybody. We appreciate your time. If you have questions, if we can get to them now, we can do that. Otherwise, feel free to drop me an email. And with that, Brian and Linda, I will turn it back over to you guys. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. All right. So we do have a few questions. I think I'm going to start um, with one for Stephanie. And I know, Stephanie, you talked about a um, little bit of the differences in technology between what's going on in Europe and what's going on here. And now that we finally have you know, um, some regulation codified in federal law. I'm just curious what the the auto manufacturer's reaction to this law has been. Well, they're not a fan, <laughs> uh, to say the least. I think, you know, no industry wants to be regulated, right? I mean, that's just the bottom line. I mean, they, they don't want the federal government telling them what they need to put on their products. And, um, this also impacts, uh, I mean, I'm not an economist or an engineer, but this impacts their ability to upcharge 
for technologies that they've already rolled out and will continue to roll out. So I think there's a lot of different reasons why they're opposed to this, uh, but they're going to continue to fight us on the regulatory front. And they're looking at more time and more money and more research needed for the dads program as which by the way we support it if if dads is what ends up in vehicles wonderful we will celebrate with the dads folks at the end of this uh journey i suppose i'll call it um but but we can't just keep saying we need more time and more funding for a program we've been talking about for 15 years um, we've got to look at what is, we've got to pick our heads up and look at what else is already being talked about in other parts of the world, um, you know, and, and test other types of technologies, see what other countries are looking at in terms of setting standards, um, you know, how they're testing this tech and how they, you know, when they determine that a car needs to be pulled over, when different actions need to be taken on the car. Uh, we support any and all technology efforts to stop the problem, but we can't just focus on one solution that we feel has had had their time. So I hope that helps. Yeah, definitely. Um, and since you have the floor, we did have one question specific on the technology um, around uh, what happens. So with the they're asking specifically about the the Subaru Outback drowsy distracted driver monitoring. Mm -hmm. What what happens? Does the does the car shut down? Does it move off the road? Is it a warning? So I I actually um, during the discussion a few minutes ago I typed up what the Euro NCAP Subaru Safety Assist report says. I don't know if everybody can see that or if it just went to that individual who asked the question. Okay. But essentially, what whether it's Subaru Outback or Volvo or uh, BMW, Mercedes, Jaguar, Land Rover that are all, you know, either have these systems or are talking about these systems in other countries. In um, Asia, they're looking at commercial fleets. There is a series of potential next steps that um, manufacturers have shown that they can already do. It can start with a warning or it can, if it's a, if it's a very risky situation that requires the car to maneuver, it can maneuver into, you know, back into a lane or slam on the brakes. That's all doable right now. And on the Volvo video, you'll see, and a lot of other manufacturers have this capability as well. They can get the car to a safe place. Um, if it can't be on the side of the road, it can, there's videos that show how the car will go to another location that's safe. Um, and we'll pull the car over. There's also limp home mode where it can slow the car down. Some manufacturers show flashing lights on the car to alert other drivers that maybe something is going on. Um, again, not an issue to get enforcement involved in. So we've got to think through all of that. But there are a number of, of actions that manufacturers have shown can be taken as a result. And that's something that's going to be part of the rulemaking process for NHTSA to figure out is what happens once impairment is detected. Um, and lastly, in the law, uh, there's actually part of the provision that says either stop the car from operating or uh, interfere with the car you know, in a way that it'll reduce risk. That I'm not quoting the law exactly, but the way that we and members of Congress wrote the bill, um, the law was to allow for NHTSA to have flexibility in terms of do you stop the car or do you somehow interfere with the driver's ability to operate the car by slowing it down or maneuvering, you know, in some other way? So we have one more question along these lines, Stephanie. I'm just going to pause here a, a moment, though, just to let people know that um, we'd like people to take a minute and fill out our evaluation survey. And I know we dropped a link of the evaluation in the chat box, but you can also use this QR code that's up on the screen right now to use your phone to fill out the survey. And I can personally vouch for the fact that the TZ leadership team absolutely reads the results from these surveys and uses the information for future events. So we appreciate you taking a little time to share your thoughts and ideas. And also note that the next webinar is November 16th. So if you have ideas for that, please let us know. Um, Stephanie, one more item. So how how does the technology um, distinguish between driver and other passengers in the car? Yeah, great question. So again, I'm not an engineer, but I can tell you that um, they have been able to do that. They have been able to uh, create such sensitive technology that they can tell if it is the driver 
versus the passenger. They've been able to do this with windows down, uh, with, with lots of other issues that have come up during testing uh, for both the suppliers who have created the tech. It's not just the manufacturers, but we've also gotten information that there are suppliers who have it. We've heard about the testing data, where they've tested it. Um, and amazingly enough, they figured it out. I mean, I just want to raise, there was an auto company not too long ago that talked about they've created paint that can change the color of the car. Um, you know, anytime I talk with an, uh, you know, industry insiders, engineers, there are, there are thousands, tens of thousands of industry engineers that work on making things, you know, more profitable for their company, which is their job. Um, including safety features they want to charge for. They can virtually do anything. <laughs> um, it's amazing. And I know it's hard for us to really think about. And when I first started talking to the industry about this 15 years ago, these are the types of questions that were raised. They've done it. They've been able to do it. And they also can make sure that if the driver is drinking as he or she is driving or smoking a joint as he or she is driving, they can do this before the driver starts the car and during, you know, while driving is actually happening um, beyond alcohol detection, along with some of these other systems. So I think just, you know, to, to wrap up that piece, any question that has come up, we have heard and we understand this, the sensitivities around a lot of this, um, but the auto industry is, and the suppliers to that industry are fully capable of solving a lot of these issues. We just need more exchange to occur between the manufacturers, the suppliers, and the Department of Transportation. We need this data and all of this incredible research to be put in the hands of NHTSA so that NHTSA can create the standard um, and look at technology outside of the DADS program. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Thank all right, you. we'll take you off the hot seat since you've been on now for, for a while. Um, and I wanna to turn to Russ for a moment and, um, Russ, you know, I, I think someone in the in the the chat or the questions had expressed kind of a disappointment around the reduction in funding in the new bill um, directed towards younger or teen drivers. Uh, any insight as to why that happened, and and you know, is there anything we should be thinking about at the state level and trying to maybe counteract that? So, um, so this is a provision that originated in 2012 in a previous transportation bill in the federal level. And the idea is to encourage more states to, to enact stronger graduated driver licensing laws, which I think is something we all we all are behind. Um, and so a Congress went through this process to put together this grant program and put together the requirements for like what would make states eligible. And what they went, what they did was set the bar as like this imagined perfect GDL system which at the time seemed like a really good idea, but in practice, it didn't work out that well because as you know, state, as you probably know, states have all different kinds of GDL provisions. And so if you have a federal standard saying like the nighttime limit has to be at 11 p.m., the, you can have no more than two passengers under 18. You have to have a supervising driver who has to have a driver's license. They have to be over 21 or they can be a driving instructor. There are all these GDL requirements that states would have had to comply with. And now many states do comply with some of them, but no state complies with all of them. And thus no state has ever qualified for this grant. And so this time around, we went to Congress and kind of explained this problem. And it's like, well, we, we think teen driver safety is really important, but we're having this problem with this grant program, like what, what can we do? And our first thought was like, well, let's simplify the eligibility requirements. Like instead of making it, you know, at 11 PM night limit, just say, you can have a night limit, you can set it at whatever you want, that, that will make you eligible for grants. But working with other safety advocates, we kind of butted heads a little bit because, you know, there are other people that still wanted to have that high bar set and to encourage states to adopt, you know, these ID, ideal GDL provisions. And so we, we never really able, were able to come to consensus as to what kind of changes we would make if we were going to retain the program. And then procedurally, uh, we went through that for a number of months. And then a, another bill, I think, in the other chamber came out that just limited the program entirely because that was also something we were an option we were considering. And for GHSA, um, this is not the only thing we're working on with the bill. Our, our members had other priorities that we were focused on as well. So we kind of just let it uh, let it go forward. And I will say that, okay, well, it looks like this funding is going away, but, it, but no state has ever qualified for this funding. So if you think about it in a certain way, for the past 10 years, states have been implementing G, uh, teen driver safety programs with federal funds without having access to the set aside of funding in anyways, right? So 
Um, so I think that's basically what states need to continue to do. Um, you can use Section 402 funding to for teen driver safety programs, depending on what you're doing. You might be able to use other Section 405 funding as well, because you know you go into high school and you talk about impaired driving, you talk about speeding, you talk about distracted driving, all these other topics that are that are also the subject of other Section 405 programs as well. So states have been kind of putting together their programs, uh, uh, you know, without without having to take advantage of, or without being able to take advantage of the teen driver grant program. And I think that's that's what we're gonna do moving forward. You know, might there be another option to have another teen driver set aside sometime in the future? Uh, of course it's possible, but um, uh, it kind of depends on how things look with GDL and teen driver safety, uh, you know, sometime in the future. Yeah, thanks Russ. I, I mean, that's something Minnesota is definitely gonna be tuned into. And, you know, we're, in the process of forming a, a younger driver action team to try to, um, you know, address some of the issues that are specific to younger drivers, but also, you know, to to start to get our young drivers educated from the start, right? And, um, you know, kind of introduce those good habits, right, as they learn to drive. And so I know we'll be spending some time on this at Minnesota in the coming years. Um, one other question we have for you, and then I think we'll wrap things up. There's a question about, are there still NHTSA grants to work on prohibiting racial profiling? So they're mentioning section 1906, and then um, maybe, and then the other piece of the question, and maybe Mike can help a little bit here, is Minnesota use these and how long, how would this look going forward under IIJ? Sure. So uh, there is grant funding available. It's, it's, it's available now, actually. Um, states can apply for it. I'm not sure if uh, Minnesota applied for it. I'm not sure if Minnesota ha is a 1906 state, so to speak. Uh, you know, a lot of states have started doing this even before the grant funding was available, or they might have a uh, traffic stop data collection program that's not run by the State Highway Safety Office, might be run by like, the state police or some other uh, state agency. And so um, there's a lot of different approaches. But, um, but the funding is available now. Uh, under the IIJ, IIJA, I think, believe, beginning in FOI 2024, um, the, some of the rules will change, uh, but um, but the, they're changing for the good. It's going to make it easier for states to apply, and there'll be more money available. But I perhaps I should defer to Mike as to what the Minnesota experience has been. Hey, thanks, Russ. Um, and long and short of it, Minnesota is not a 1906 state. Uh, and really, the only reason that, that we don't qualify and can't apply for the funds is we just don't have a means to capture uh, the, the racial and ethnic data uh, that would be needed in order to qualify for that. Um, there was a significant push during the last legislative session um, to uh, allow that type of data to be uh, captured, um, but it didn't make it across the finish line. I would be surprised if it doesn't come back again um, in some form or iteration at some point in the future. Um, I attended a number of briefings and provided a bunch of information regarding 1906. And actually, I, I believe, Russ, it's Connecticut that um, has a, a really solid model program for how to use that 1906 data in a meaningful and positive way. It's not a punitive program at all. Um, and it provides real-time information, not only to the communities, but to the law enforcement agencies uh, that, that work in the various communities. So um, we will continue to monitor that. And if there's a way for us to capture some of that 1906 money, um, and there's a way for us to capture the data that is required, we absolutely stand ready to do that. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Russ and Stephanie, for your thoughtful responses to some of the questions. We're at 1014 here, so I think we need to wrap things up. There are a few um, additional items we'd like to share before we do. We're finally back in person for our TZD statewide conference this year. It's going to be at the St. Cloud River's Edge Convention Center on October 12th and 13th. We have an amazing lineup of keynote speakers and 40 concurrent sessions. We would love to see you in person, but if you're not able to attend in person, you can register to be a virtual attendee. Um, it'll cost you $125 either way, in person or virtual. Uh, and there are a number of sessions um, you know, that will be available to you, including the plenary sessions and um, 
not all of the concurrent sessions, but some of the concurrent sessions will be available virtually. Exhibitor and sponsor registration is open now and closes September 1st. Conference information, including hotel accommodation, sponsorship, and exhibitor information are all available on the TZD website. Registration opens in exactly one week on, on August 23rd. So we really hope to see you in October. As I mentioned, our next Traffic Safety Hot Dish webinar is scheduled for November 16th. So re reserve it on your calendars and let us know what kind of hot dish you are hungry for. With that, I'll put an end to the corny hot dish references and offer a special thank you to our speakers today and to our viewers. We hope you learned something new and will share your knowledge with your colleagues. We encourage you to follow the Minnesota TZD program on social media, including Twitter and Facebook, and watch for the latest news on our TZD website, minnesotatzd.org. Thank you for joining us and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.